today we are not talking ophthalmology, but we are talking about uh, continuous medical education. We have two presenters today. Uh, the first presenter will be Sam Pachfuntu. She's a ophthalmology registrar based at Indola Teaching Hospital, currently in third year. The second presenter is Dr. Kawa Membe, a director at the Health Professions Council of Zambia. Dr. Membe is a dental surgeon currently serving as director registration at the Health Professions Council of Zambia. She has oversight of registration and compliance monitoring of health practitioners. Dr. Membe has a Bachelor of Dental Surgery from Volograd Medical, Medical State University in Russia. She began her career at Ronald Rose General Hospital in Muflira before moving to the dental department at uh, Kitwe Central Hospital for five years. She then joined the dental training school, the sole institution in Zambia which offers training in dental therapy, dental technology and dental assisting in the capacity of acting principal for three years. Dr. Kawa, we are privileged to have you join today's presentation and it will be an honor to listen from you. Our moderator from this, on, on this day, Professor Sekelani Banda, I think uh, needs no introduction to most of us that have passed through Ridgeway School of Medicine. Professor Sekelani Banda has over 30 years work experience as a medical doctor, educator, scholar, and consultant for the health sector. He has served in senior positions in academia, consulting firms, the Ministry of Health, and he has sat on numerous boards of directors. Currently, he's the Associate Professor of Medical Education and Clinical Anatomy in the Department of Medical Education at the School of Medicine at the University of Zambia. Previously, he was Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs of Levi Mwanawasa Medical University and Professor of Medical Education and Clinical Anatomy. Professor Banda is the immediate first director for the Department of Training and Development at the Ministry of Health, Zambia, and immediate first chairperson for the Third Council of the Health Professions Council of Zambia, HPCZ. Professor Banda was the recipient of the Zambia Medical Association 2019 Meritorious Award. Prof, it's an honor to have you moderate today's session, and we are, we are hoping that with the title of the journal that we are having today, I think your input and your experience will really, really make it a very exciting journal to listen to. I think with this few introduction, I hand over to the presenters so that they can begin the presentation of the journal. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Funjika, before everyone comes in, I just want to mention that uh, everyone who is joining for the sake of uh, registration, kindly log in with your full name so that we can check the register. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think Dr. Chfunto, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Funjika. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, okay, so I'm kind of asking for the host to please enable me to share my screen. Are you, could you try again? It's enabled. Okay. Okay, so good evening, everyone, once again. My name is Dr. Chifuntu. I'm a registrar of ophthalmology based at Ndola Tijin Hospital. And I will be taking you uh, through the first presentation that we have for this journal club. So today we'll be discussing an article that is taken from the Asia Pacific Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, which was published in 2018. And the title is how to add metacognition to your continuing professional development, a scooping review and recommendation. So before we get into the journal uh, article for today, I will just take us through uh, a brief introduction as we define certain terms that will be key to our article for today. 
So we'll talk about cognition, we'll talk about what metacognition is and what continuing professional development is. So cognition is simply uh, mental uh, processes that are involved with the acquisition, the storage, the manipulation, and the retrieval of information. That is what, uh, that is what cognition is. And metacognition in layman's language is really thinking about your thinking. So it's thinking about your cognition. And if we bring it uh, close to home, in medical terms, we're talking about your ability to, to think about your clinical judgment, to think about your diagnostic thinking and the consideration of a patient's perspective uh, with regards to their illness, and also the ability to consider and look at all the treatment options that you have with regards to your, to your patient. So in other terms, we could say metacognition is a higher order of thinking, which involves active control over cognitive processes that are engaged as you make decisions for your patient. And uh, continuing professional development uh, is used interchangeably with continuous medical education. And so even in this presentation, I'll be using CPD and C CME to mean the same thing. And this is uh, basically just the process of tracking, uh, documenting the skills, the knowledge, the experience that you gain, both formally and informally as you work beyond your initial training. So uh, CPD would be what we're having right now, a journal club, it could be a workshop, it could be a lecture, it could be a conference, all those are CPD activities. And what we're having right now is could count as a CPD activity. So back to our article for today, the title is how to add metacognition to your continuing professional development, a scoping review and recommendation. So uh, as mentioned earlier, our study type for today is a scoping review, which means it's an overview of, of articles that have been done before concerning the matter. And the methodology that was used to publish this article uh, was taken from PubMed. So the authors on, on April 25th of 2018 went to PubMed and typed in terms uh, such as metacognition, CPD and CME. And when they searched PubMed, five articles came up. These five articles were from different disciplines of medicine, such as pediatrics, and no article was found, which, which, which is directly related to ophthalmology. So there was no specific ophthalmology paper that was found. However, the five articles were extrapolated to ophthalmology, and that is what we'll be discussing today. So in this scoping review, the articles that were reviewed uh, produced data that was grouped into five categories. So there's concepts in metacognition, there's metacognition in medical education, metacognition and the CPD learner, promoting CPD and the role of the CPD educator. So I'll, I'll slowly take you through these five categories of information that they came up with from the articles that they reviewed. So the first thing is the concepts in metacognition and cognition. So the, the authors uh, found out that uh, metacognition is involved uh, with two things, which is metacognitive knowledge and metacognitive regulation. Metacognitive knowledge is simply the acquired knowledge about cognitive processes. And metacognitive regulation is where you plan, you monitor, and evaluate the knowledge that you acquire. So the two are very interconnected, and you need both of them to have uh, a successful metacognition in what you're doing. And then I must mention also that metacognition and cogn cognition are very similar, and they overlap. They overlap. So for example that I can give is, uh, an example that we can understand as ophthalmologists would be when you're doing biometry. When you're doing biometry, the knowledge of the technique of doing bi biometry is cognition. However, the knowledge of reviewing the result that you get and determining if it is clinically significant to your patient is what is called as metacognition. So the two overlap, but they are, they, they, they're, they are both very important in our practice. And so that is why in this article, we're discussing uh, how we can add this metacognition 
to our CPD. Uh, in this uh, screen, I'm showing you uh, factors, both internal and external, that affect cognition and metacognition. So it is said that cognition is a system that is interrelated. So there's cognitive system, there's affective system, non-academic context, and academic context. So these are factors that they all work at play to produce a proper cognition in someone. So the cognitive system, which will involve the metacognition of a person, their cognition, their ability to critically think about a matter, uh, their ability to form strategies of learning. And then the affective system would uh, imply their motivation. What, what motivates them to learn? Their attitude and their affect, such as their mood. Research shows that mood such as happiness affects how someone uh, learns because it makes searching uh, from their memory much easier than when they are sad. And then the academic context would be the content. What content are they digesting and who's, is, who's instructing them and in what environment are they learning? And then the non-academic context would imply their family background because how someone is brought up affects how they perceive things. So their family background, their culture, their socioeconomic status, all these things are interlinked and they are at play and they all influence someone's cognition. So the other concepts that are discussed with regards to metacognition are the fact that there's a difference between self-directed learning and self-regulated learning. Self-directed learning is where an individual understands their needs. What do they need to learn? So they understand the needs, the learning needs, and then they set goals. They set appropriate goals for their learning. And then they identify resources. The resources that they should identify should include both material resources such as books and also human resource. Who are you learning from? Is it a lecturer? Um, is it a coach? Is it uh, a fellow a peer? Is, who, who is the human resource that you're learning from? And when you identify these resources, you must then implement appropriate strategies with how you will learn and acquire this knowledge. And then when you do the learning, you must then come back and evaluate the outcome of your learning. And this is different from self-regulated learning in that self-regulated learning is where an individual sets goals, quite all right, but then they go a bit further to monitor, regulate, control their cognition, their motivation, their behavior, and they do all this in the context of the environment in which they are found. So the other uh, concept that is discussed under metacognition is that there are three domains of learning. So the first domain is psychomotor. Uh, the example of a psychomotor domain of learning is just acquiring a physical skill. So when you learn how to do a cataract surgery, that's a psychomotor domain of learning. Cognitive domain of learning is just acquiring information. Like the example that I gave, where you now learn how to do biometry, that is a cognitive domain of learning. And last but not the least is affective domain of learning. Uh, so research shows that this is, uh, it's not synonymous to metacognition, but affective learning is uh, the highest level of knowledge that can be acquired. And this, in, this comprises of someone's beliefs, someone's behavior, and someone's attitude. So uh, table one shows us the types of knowledge that can be acquired and also just uh, uh, the ophthalmology specific examples so that we can understand better. So this table was uh, reprinted and the authors added uh, the specific ophthalmology uh, examples that were noted in the initial table that they found in the articles that they reviewed. So the first type of knowledge or the first level of knowledge is the factual knowledge. And this is basically just the basic elements that students must know to be acquainted with a discipline or solve problems in it. So when it comes back to us as ophthalmologists, a, factual, a type of factual knowledge would be anatomy of the eye. That is factual knowledge. The iris remains the iris, the trabecular matrix remains the trabecular matrix, the eyelid remains the eyelid. That is factual knowledge. So those are basic elements and they must be acquainted with 
for us to be able to solve problems in ophthalmology. When we talk about concept knowledge, we're talking about the interrelationships among the basic elements that we learn from factual knowledge. So an example would be phototransduction cascade or the pathophysiology of glaucoma. All this make up what is known as concept knowledge. The other type of knowledge is procedural knowledge. So this is where you learn uh, specific skills, uh, such as operating skills. Uh, the last type of knowledge is metacognitive knowledge. Now, this is what we're talking about today. So this is the awareness of one's own cognition. So thinking about your own thinking. And in ophthalmology, uh, the example we can give is the knowledge of the fact that there's use of heuristics. Heuristics are just mental shortcuts or techniques that one comes up with to solve problems. So every time that we are in clinic, we're using heuristics, we're using mental shortcuts that will give us immediate results with regards to the patients that we are seeing. If you are attending to 20 patients, you have a way that you've, you've taught yourself to reason to say glaucoma looks like this, a collagen looks like this. When you're seeing a patient, you're not going through the entire Kansky, you're not going through the entire pathophysiology, but you're using heuristics to come up with diagnosis and solve problems on the spot. So metacognitive knowledge uh, implies that we should know the use of heuristics. So the other thing that we discuss is metacognition in medical education. So research showed that there's a need for metacognition to be very much implied in medical education as medicine is a broad and growing field. And so there's expected continuing and rapid expansion in, in the knowledge that we acquire as, uh, as medical personnel. And so this uh, field requires individuals to be receptive to acquiring, developing and applying new skills. And so when metacognition is applied in medical education, it trains medical students to be able to be receptive and ready for continuous learning, even as they pursue their career. So the other thing we'll discuss is metacognition and the CPD learner. The CPD learner is you and me. So everyone who is learning and attending workshops and journal clubs uh, beyond their training is a CPD learner. So research showed that uh, cognitive skills decline with age. So as you are getting older, your cognitive skills begin to decline. However, metacognitive capabilities remain preserved. And so it is expected that as we are growing, as we're becoming consultants, as we are growing older, that we use metacognitive abilities to improve goal-related memory outcomes during CPD activities like this one and also just in our general practice as ophthalmologists. And the reason uh, for this is that a research that was done also showed that a research was actually done on medical students and doctors, which showed that uh, they are prone to inaccurate self-assessment. And this inaccurate self-assessment leads to inflated egos, inflated views about oneself or pessimistic views about oneself. And this poor in, and inaccurate self-assessment was attributed to poor uh, metacognitive abilities. And so research shows that improved metacognition will result in accurate self-assessment for doctors and medical, medical students. So promotion of metacognition in CPD. How do we promote metacognition in CPD? The first thing is awareness and instruction. The second thing is awareness and mitigation of cognitive errors, appropriate needs analysis, the choice of appropriate activities for CPD, learning of new surgical skills, and also the recording of all these activities that are employed using portfolios. I'll just uh, break down these. Um, so that we can understand better how uh, the promotion of metacognition in CPD can be done. So the first thing, like I said, is awareness and instruction. So there are people who are not aware that metacognition actually exists. So the first thing to do is build that awareness that metacognition exists. And when we build the awareness, there should be formal instruction from the CPD teachers, uh, from the consultants, they should be able to instruct formally 
uh, what metacognition is in our CPD. And uh, the, the second thing is awareness and mitigation of cognitive errors. So we must recognize that the use of heuristics in clinical reasoning exists. So we should recognize that they are there. And then when we recognize that they are there, then we come up with strategies to minimize errors or rather minimize cognitive bias. So the errors that will come from the use of heuristics will lead to cognitive bias. Uh, table two is a table that is showing us different types of cognitive bias and the errors that they bring about in clinical reasoning. So there are lots of, of them, but I'll just uh, pick a few uh, so that we can understand what we're talking about. So one example I can keep pick here is availability bias. So availability bias is where you judge that a disease is more likely simply because it comes readily to your mind. So because TB comes readily to your mind, every person who comes to you has TB. So that is availability bias. The other example I can pick on is confirmation bias. This is a tendency to look for evidence that will confirm a diagnosis that you're thinking about rather than uh, evidence that will refute a diagnosis that you're thinking about. So there's, there's tendency to have confirmation bias. Uh, the other one I can pick up on is gender bias. So this is where you believe uh, that sex is a determin determining factor in the probability of disease, even when there's no pathophysiological evidence to support that. And um, the other type that I can pick is overconfidence bias. So this is the bias where you tend to believe that you know more than you do. And so this can be augmented by availability bias because these are the things that are available. You begin to think that you know more than you actually do. And the other one, the last one, I will pick on as an example is search satisfying bias. So this is where you call off a search once you find something. So a patient can come in, they have maybe two foreign bodies, but because you found one, you become satisfied and you miss the second foreign body because you actually found something and you stop there. So you call off a search because you found something. Okay, the last one. Uh, from the cognitive bias, I think is the zebra retreat. Uh, I think this one is also important. So the zebra retreat is where you hesitate to diagnose rare conditions, even when they are most likely. So a patient comes in and they have Kawasaki and because you don't know much about it and it's not uh, so common in, our, in your environment, you hesitate to make that diagnosis. That's a zebra retreat. So we must uh, understand that these cognitive bias exist because of heuristics that we come up with as we attend to patients. And so table three then now comes up with the strategy. So we must recognize that the bias is there and then now come up with strategies that should mitigate uh, the errors and the bias that we we'll encounter uh, in our clinical reasoning. So the first thing to do is develop insight and awareness. So you must know, provide a detailed description of the non-cognitive biases that are common to you and also have clinical examples, like the clinical example that I gave for the foreign body, you must know and be aware that it exists. And then now you consider alternatives. Uh, so you, you have a first consideration of alternative possibilities. You should always ask yourself, what else could this be? And then now this is where now we have metacognition, you know, where you, you are trained for a reflective approach to problem solving. The other uh, strategies would include accountability, uh, you know, to provide uh, clear accountability and follow up for the decisions that you are making and also minimize time pressures. Uh, so there should be adequate time for quality decision making as we do uh, our practice in ophthalmology. And then uh, finally, there should be feedback, proper feedback. So the mechanism should be to provide as rapid and reliable feedback as possible so that errors can be immediately appreciated and corrected. So the other way to promote metacognition would be to come up with appropriate needs analysis. So we must know the needs that are available and analyze them. But as mentioned earlier, research showed that uh, our, our ability to self uh, analyze and self assess is very poor according to research that was done. So it is then advised that we involve subjective 
subjective people or rather objective people to give us the needs analysis that we need to come up with proper CPD activities. And so the first one is to get feedback from your peers. You know, this can come, this, this uh, can come from maybe the audits that we do, morbidity, mortality audits, that would give you proper feedback from your peers and that would then feed your needs analysis appropriately. The other people that can give us objective feedback are patients. Patients are always either, they're either complaining or thanking you. So when they complain, you know which areas are lacking. And so that should be able to feed your appropriate needs analysis and give us a view of what needs to be worked on. So CPD teachers can also come in, medical regulators, hospital administrators. These are the ones, hospital administrators, HCC, they're the ones who always get the complaints from the patients. So all the patients' complaints somehow, somehow end up in the HCC's office in the hospital administrators. And so the hospital administrators will be able to, to have an idea of what the outliers are with regards to our practice. And so when we get now the feedback from the hospital administrators, we'll be able to know what CPD activities we need to do and what needs to be worked on, what needs to be improved, what needs to be kept, and so, so forth. And also national training bodies would be very helpful with coming up with appropriate needs analysis. And so now when we analyze the need, then now we have to choose appropriate CPD activities. So a CPD activity would be like a journal club that we're having right now. It could be a lecture as shown in this table. The first one would be a lecture. It would be an interactive workshop. Uh, it would be a small group meeting. It would be a wet lab. It would be a conference. And so there are certain things that you as a CPD learner now has to to engage, there are certain things that you have to ask yourself. You have to plan, you have to monitor, and you have to evaluate your own learning. So the example that I would give is the first, the first one here, the di didactic uh, lecture. So this is where you have a lecture of more than 20 participants. As a CPD learner, the first thing you can do is plan. And how do you plan? By asking yourself, what do I know about this topic? As you are going for this lecture, you must know what you know about the topic, and what questions do you, do you have about this topic? That's you planning. And the next step is monitoring. So you, as the lecture is going on, you must be able to monitor what you are learning. So you must ask yourself, what insights am I having during this lecture? What questions are arising for me during this class session? And when the class session is over, you must go home and evaluate and ask yourself, what was most interesting about today's lecture? What do I need to do to get my questions answered? That is one of the examples that I can pick to actually show how we can engage as learners when it comes to CPD. The other one which is common to us would be this last example, the wet lab. As you are going in for a wet lab, you must ask yourself as a way of planning, what technique do I want to learn? What is the literature regarding the outcomes and complications of the procedure that I'm learning? And as you are doing wet lab, you have your instructor with you. And so you have to ask yourself, uh, as a way um, of monitoring your learning. How am I performing compared with my instructor? And when, it, when the wet lab is done, you must be able to evaluate by asking yourself, how can I improve my next wet lab session? How will I use this new technique in patient care? And how can I audit my results? So this really is a table just showing the examples of how we can be involved as learners uh, in coming up with appropriate CPD activities and how we can plan, monitor and evaluate our own learning. So the other way to promote metacognition in CPD is learning new surgical techniques. So when it comes to learning new surgical techniques, the only way to promote metacognition is number one, to set learning goals and not performance goals. Remember you're a CPD learner. So even as you are acquiring this new surgical technique, the only way to promote metacognition would be if you set uh, learning targets and not performance targets. And also the people that are teaching, the instructors should be able to promote metacognition by scaffolding. So scaffolding is where you learn to hold uh, the student's hand uh, step by step until you are confident that they are now ready to stand on their own. So if we're going to promote metacognition in CPD, it's not the instructors uh, uh, should not be the instructors should not 
throw the students in the deep end and allow them to swim on their own. Rather, they should be scaffolding, they should be holding them, making them feel comfortable as they learn. And then when we're confident that they know uh, what they're doing, then we can leave them alone to be able to do the procedures by themselves. And the other way to promote metacognition as we learn new surgical techniques is by providing rubrics. These are guidelines. So this can be adopted from uh, places like ICO, International uh, uh, Council of Ophthalmology. So we can get guidelines from there with regards to the surgical technique that we are learning, and that will be able to promote metacognition uh, in CPD. So uh, finally, we'll talk about the role of the CPD educator. So as a CPD educator, you also have a role to play. And what you have to do is plan. Plan for the CPD activities and communicate the objectives uh, early enough and very vividly for all the learners to be able to know what is expected of them. So plan the activities, communicate your objectives, and if possible, do a pretest. A pretest will enable the CPD educator to have a rough understanding of the knowledge levels of the learners. So a pretest is essential as it will be able to, to guide, uh, to know whether somebody learned something from that CPD activity or not. So a pretest must be done and then I will review the test with the learners and then be able to correct them. The idea or the goal of a CPD is that people should improve their skills, people should improve their knowledge, people should improve their experience. So if we do pretests and then uh, we review the test and then we correct the learners, then we'll be able to know and assess that learning is actually taking place. The other thing that is, uh, a CPD educator can do is thinking out loud. This is where you share with the learners how you came up with, with the diagnosis, for example. We'll be able to know how you, your mental uh, reasoning was for you to arrive at a certain answer. And so we'll be able to then learn as learners how you reason your clinical judgment and be able to, to learn from that and improve the skills, knowledge, and experience as CPD learners. So these are the recommendations that the authors came up with from this scoping, uh, scoping review as they analyze all the articles uh, that came up. And the first thing is that metacognition uh, be explicitly taught in medical school and also in ophthalmology training. So metacognition must be taught. And, and that the benefits and the risks of heuristics be taught to practicing ophthalmologists. The other recommendation was that CPD educators design activities to promote higher levels of cogni cognition, e.g. flipped classroom, uh, different methodologies that should promote uh, cognition. The other recommendation that was made is that medical educators should design tools which are better able to measure metacognition in practicing ophthalmologists. And then that ophthalmology societies should encourage the use of personal learning plans, the audits of results and recording of activities in portfolios. So uh, the final recommendation is that research be directed towards the hypothesis that improving metacognition in participants, in CPD teachers and in CPD activities makes CPD more effective and time efficient. So research should be done. And the other hypothesis should be improving metacognition will enhance learning of new surgical techniques. So it is recommended by the authors that research be done towards these two hypotheses. So in conclusion, the authors concluded that we are expected us as ophthalmologists in training and even those who are already practicing, we are expected to be self-directed learners for the rest of our career. And this requires metacognitive skills to plan, monitor and evaluate our own learning. So uh, the other conclusion is that the evidence based on metacognition in CPD is very weak. And so definite conclusions are not possible, hence the need for more research. And so metacognition in CPD can also be promoted through the other the things that uh, I mentioned earlier, and that instructors of CPD, uh, such as uh, HPCZ, will play a vital and pivotal role in CPD. So how do we then critique this uh, review. So the methods, uh, the review, the review came from five articles. So I, I felt that there was scant literature. Uh, I feel like five articles are not enough. 
So uh, the method that was used, PubMed, I don't know if there could be other, uh, the other literature out there besides the five articles that came up, but I really felt that the method that was used to come up with this overview was quite scanty. And then the assignments is that there's no specific one article that was picked, all the five articles were picked and reviewed to come up with this scoping um, review. Uh, the assessment, I would say that the study question was well addressed uh, with all those uh, categories of information that were categorized, uh, talking about the CPD learner, talking about the CPD uh, educator, and also just making us understand what cognition and metacognition is about. And then the results, like I, uh, I said, were well grouped and tabulated and well to follow. Uh, the interpretation, uh, I think the authors interpreted uh, the articles that they reviewed very well. And they came up with the fact that metacognition is necessary for successful CPD. However, because of the paucity of the literature, they are encouraging that more research be done. And then when it comes to extrapolation, I totally agree that, that there is need for us to extrapolate the information that we've learned today into our own clinical and our own uh, learning. We've been doing general clubs for a while now, but there's been no need for deliberate uh, promotion of metacognition because for starters, we haven't even known what metacognition is. So there's need for us uh, to be deliberate about promoting this metacognition so that we can get the best uh, from our CPD activities, such as this journal club. And so there's also need for awareness and formal instruction. And I think that the, the HPCZ will be able to guide and even just our educators should be able to give us that formal instruction. There's, you know, to promote the awareness and also that formal instruction of just applying metacognition in our CPD activities. And this ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Doc. Uh, Dr. Funjika, are we going to listen to the other presentation or we are able to proceed and discuss uh, what Dr. Sampa has presented and then proceed, um, kindly guide. I think Professor, we can listen to the next presentation so that we have a discussion like of, of both from both present presentations. Right, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes we, we are. are. Okay, thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to the organizers. Thank you so much for inviting um, HBCZ to this meeting. And to Professor Banda, it's a privilege to be here with you, sir. So today we're talking about CPD for health practitioners from a regulatory point of view. Okay, a brief introduction is that the Health Professions Council of Zambia is the regulatory authority mandated to register health practitioners and regulate their professional conduct. We license health facilities and accredit um, health uh, services offered in these facilities. We also approve health training programs. We recognize and approve health training programs. And um, 
In so doing, the HPCZ is committed to promoting high standards of public health by maintaining appropriate practice standards among health practitioners. We are governed by an act, the Health Professions Act number 24 of 2009 and section 35 um, is the section It appears there's a uh, there's a breaking network for 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 Dr. Mumembe. Yeah, we've lost the slide. Yes, I just sent a message. Also, I was concerned that the the words were not very clear and it seemed to be breaking up. Um, maybe Prof, since we've lost uh, Dr. Mimbe, probably we can take questions or any comments or if you have any additions to, to the presentation. All right, uh, so do we, do we have somebody who's trying to contact her and reconnect her and then they will let us to uh, when that is done and we can continue? Yes, I think Dr. Mumbi will follow up with her and then you yeah. can inform us once. Yes, she, she is just joining. Uh, let me just um, add that to the panelist. She, she was having challenges with the network. Uh, so we wait? Uh, yes, she just joined. All right. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My apologies, I was thrown out of the meeting. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how much you heard. Can I continue from this slide? Dr. Mumembe, I think there's a challenge with your network. Uh, you're breaking, the line is breaking. I'm not sure whether you have an alternative um, uh, line for the internet. I think for the past uh, uh, few minutes that we had, um, it wasn't clear. Uh-oh. Uh, maybe you can try to see maybe if the network comes back. Let me try. I see. Okay, let me try an alternative network. Okay. So I'm not sure where I um, where I ended. Were you able to see this third screen that is that is um, showing now? Yes, we're able to follow the slides. It was just the voice. And the voice sounds Can you better hear me? now. Yes, yes, it's yes, better. It's much better. Is it better now? Wonderful. 
Yes, yes. The okay. Main procedure. Um, so if I can continue from here, I was just saying that CPD is an integral part of professional practice, as was highlighted in okay as was highlighted in the previous presentation and it is encouraged as a quality assurance process to promote and enhance practitioners fitness to practice and also to enhance um, the practitioner's professional image and to enhance public confidence in the health sector. We also talk about CPD being necessitated by constantly, trending, constantly changing trends in disease patterns, new technologies and management approaches as well in order to sustain the provision of quality health care. So HPCZ has the mandate to accredit CPD providers to ensure that the CPD programs being offered to health practitioners are in line with set standards and are relevant to the practice of health practitioners. So currently, the uh, have we lost her again? Uh, I'm afraid, yes. Uh, I think uh, because of network. All right. Okay, so maybe as, as she gets to recall, uh, rejoin the meeting and somebody in the background can contact her, uh, we can have a, a, some discussion around the first presentation with... Uh, I'm oh, here. okay, she's back. I'm All right. Here. My apologies. Um, So if I may continue from this slide, we were talking about the types of CPD um, platforms that are currently available. And we are saying that HPCZ recon recognizes two modes. So physical CPD, online CPD. Physical CPD can be undertaken um, in various ways. We have um, conferences, seminars, symposia, or workshops, which can be attended or facilitated. We can convene or organize special lectures, we can organize or attend morbidity and mortality meetings. Um, we can participate in grand rounds and clinical meetings and participate in hands-on and interactive skills workshops. We can undertake short courses as well. Um, attachments in centers of excellence are recognized as CPD as well. And you can author or co-author a peer-reviewed publication or a book or a book chapter. You can undertake a peer review activity. This refers to um, cases where a health practitioner is invited by the council to assess credentials of another health practitioner or assess files for the purpose of a council inquiry. You can um, be a keynote speaker or a guest lecturer in presentations that last at least 45 minutes. And you can participate in online CPD activities such as the one we are attending today. And we, the development of an online CPD course also counts as um, CPD. You can be a part of a technical working group. You can be a CPD coordinator of an accredited provider and any professional upgrade studies such as a, a postgraduate um, training program also counts as CPD. 
And so when we speak of online CPD, it refers to activities involving interactive online learning for more than 30 minutes. It also uh, refers to lecturing accredited courses online. And it also refers to the development of online CPD courses, which are peer reviewed and of course accredited by the council. So currently, I mean, online CPD is accessible through various platforms um, where practitioners can sign up for and undertake these CPD programs. And currently the council has um, entered into a partnership with the World Continuing Education Alliance. They are an affiliate of the World Medical Association in the UK and CPD, free CPD courses can be accessed through the website cpd.wcea.education and they also have a mobile app which can be downloaded um, for access to these courses. I must mention that um, these courses can also be accessed through the Zambia Medical Association platform. Um, there is another partnership that the council has entered into with MPC Consulting, and this is a South African company which provides online medical education as well and access to medical journals, um, short courses, and CME courses. They are a subsidiary of the Foundation for Professional Development in South Africa and the South African Medical Association. So in addition to this, the council recently developed the CPD portal, it launched this portal in September this year. And here CPD providers can apply for approval of CPD and training programs. And thereafter upload accrued CPD points for their member participants. We are hoping that the society will um, take advantage of this portal and accredit so that these meetings can officially be um, recognized. And so the next table now talks about the weighting of the CPD activities. So where you have a conference or seminar, if you, if you are attending a seminar which is lasting less than three days, you accumulate 10 points. And the evidence on the far right um, just tells you what you would need to um, present to the council. And so if I can briefly go through seminars, 10 points, if they last longer, 20 points. If it's a special lecture you, that you attend, you'll get 10 points. If you are giving a special lecture, you accrue 20 points. If you are the facilitator or coordinator, in a conference, you will accrue 20 points and so on and so forth. Let me, this information can be shared at a later time. But if, if we all have a CPD booklet, then um, the information is readily available in it. So one thing of note here is that for the online CPD activities, you'll see, um, Attending an activity will accrue five points and being involved in lecturing online will give one 15 points, development of a course, 50 points. And so we must state that CPD is mandatory for all registered health practitioners at all points of service delivery. And this includes those serving in training institutions. A minimum of 100 points is required annually. And it is now a requirement for one to remain on the Health Professions Council of Zambia uh, register. So at the end, the completed CPD form is to be uploaded to the HPCZ um, online services portal or emailed to us at that email address with the proof of your annual fee payment 
in order to access the annual practicing certificates. And it's also, um, also of note is that any um, CPD activities must be recognized or approved by the unit supervisor as being relevant to the practitioner's professional practice. So for the CPD providers wishing to provide online CPD training, um, they are required to submit details of the responsible personnel to HPCZ HPCZ in turn will initialize the creation of an account for the CPD provider. And then the CPD provider can create credentials via the portal and submit an application for approval of that CPD program. Once approved, the CPD providers can upload all the practitioner CPD activities provided via the online services portal and then HPCZ can view the activities with accrued points, which will then be linked to the practitioner profiles in the regulatory human resource information systems uh, managed by the HPCZ. So this is just to show you what the, the front page of the portal looks like. And this is where the accounts are created. For practitioners wishing to renew their annual practicing certificates, um, and they need to upload proof of CPD by visiting the online services portal after having undertaken the CPD. And so this system is now being configured to enable uploading of proof of CPD into the renewal portal, especially considering that we are nearing the renewal period for annual practicing certificates of 2021. So on this portal, each, each member practitioner will have an education tracker that stores information of courses completed and passed and you can then upload and later access certificates and reports of CPD undertaken. This is the front page of our online services portal. Um, varying services are provided on this portal, such as registration of health practitioners, and then also renewal of annual practicing certific um, certificates. So thank you so much for your attention. Do contact us if in need of any information. We're here to serve. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Membe. Uh, can we now proceed uh, to the question and answer session or some clarifications? Dr. Fungika? Hello? I think Dr. Fungika is there. Maybe she's a bit occupied. I think, Professor, we can uh, okay. proceed. All right, thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to thank both our presenters, uh, Dr. Chifuntu and Dr. Membe, uh, for very insightful presentations. We can take some questions or comments with regarding uh, Dr. Chifuntu's presentation. Uh, she did walk us through metacognition and how it relates to CPD, uh, and also inherently how it uh, makes us think about our diagnostic reasoning and clinical practice. Uh, she mentioned self-directed learning uh, and also did uh, give us a, a process and how all those things are related to diagnostic biases. Uh, I'd like to open it up to any questions or comments regarding uh, Dr. Chifunto's presentation. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box so far. Are there, okay. is there anyone raising a, a hand? Oh yeah, there's a hand. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, yes, you, you may proceed, please. Hi there. Um, thank you for the great presentations, uh, doctors. Very useful information. Um, I'm. I just had a couple of questions. Being an optometrist, I don't fall into the conventional um, medical category, but um, obviously the CPD requirements are are the same. Um, it's it's quite difficult to find uh, local courses which apply to my profession. So of course, as you mentioned, that um, I can use international ones. Uh, would any international course be recognized as long as I get some sort of identification that I have attended it? Um, my second question is the booklet that is available for uh, CPD requirements here. I am never able to get my hands on it. Every time I've been to the HPCZ offices, it's it's never available. If I could know where I could obtain this booklet so I have more information. Thank you. Do you want to go at that quickly? Yes, please, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, yes, so for internationally acquired CPD, currently we, it is our wish to know that you are developing yourself professionally and we understand um, the limitations locally. So yes, we will accept um, internationally acquired CPD provided you are able to upload the certificates that um, you will be issued. And for the CPD booklets, we have a soft copy available for download on the HPCZ website. Alternatively, you can email, I will put the email address in on the chat section. You can email us and we will send you a, we will send you a, a copy of the booklet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Chifuntu, could you kindly uh, give us a critique of the paper with regards to the levels of evidence? I know you did give some mention about that, uh, but just to give an overview of the overall uh, critique of the paper with regards to levels of evidence, so we know how, uh, how we take what the recommendations are. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Professor. So uh, with regards to evidence, they actually, the author has actually said that there's very weak evidence uh, from the articles that they reviewed. And uh, so they actually encourage that we should do more research, especially with regards to how we can add metacognition to CPD. So the evidence is quite weak and there's need for more research to be done. And also, especially that uh, well, the articles that are being used are extrapolated from other uh, medical disciplines like pediatrics. So we're actually getting information from other disciplines and just extrapolating them to fit uh, our specialty, which is ophthalmology. So there's really need for more research with regards to metacognition. Thank you very much. Thank you. So maybe in addition to your uh, final assessment uh, at the end, uh, do, lo looking at the pyramid of evidence would be nice as you finalize the presentation of the paper. Uh, so that in addition to the MARI acronym I think you used, uh, you could also uh, show the level, the pyramid of evidence, and you are able to show that. Uh, where, where are we with regards to this paper so that we are always putting this uh, into context. But another quick one, uh, just to regarding some of the things you presented, what's your comment about reflective practice with regards to metacognition? Um, okay, so my comment is that there is need for us to do uh, reflective practice. 
because most times we we become we, we practice like on autopilot you know I, this this going to be a bad example but <laughs> Uh, I'd like to, to give an example of sometimes clinical officers, you know, where they just know that a cough is equal to a pneumonia is equal to a moxil. Those are the heuristics that they are using in their practice. And for some reason, it works for them. But then when we employ reflective approach, we'll be able to actually be able to analyze and deal with patients as individuals and also just deal with them holistically and not throw heuristics in front of every single patient that we come across. So there is really need for us to reflect on how we are practicing, and not only in our practice, even in our CPD, the other activities that we're doing outside of our clinic, it's good to be able to reflect on, on what we're learning and how everything is going. I so is reflective, thank, is reflective practice the same thing as metacognition? Just help us unpack that so that we know uh, how the take home messages from today's presentation. Okay, so like I said, metacognition is thinking about your cognition, how you're thinking um, about something. So when we talk about reflective approach, I think it, it, it would be in line with metacognition because then you'll be able to, to reflect on how you're practicing something. So you're actually being forced to think about your clinical reasoning. You are being forced to think about how you are thinking about what you're thinking about. So I would, I would say that uh, it's, it's, the same, it's the same thing, really. It's part of, rather. So reflective, reflective thinking or reflective approach is part of metacognition. Okay, so it would be nice to really think about reflective practice and metacognition and put it in that context. Uh, as the last one, you, you had mentioned, you, you gave us a definition of procedural knowledge. Remember when you talked about practical, no, uh, factual knowledge, uh, conceptual yes. knowledge, then yes. you talked about procedural knowledge, and then you said these are operating skills. Uh, could you unpack that for the audience? Uh, so procedural knowledge is, is just learning how to do a procedure. So, so it's, not learned... just, it's not just operating, even just putting a cannula, that's a procedure. So it's all the procedures that you learn as, as you practice your, your medicine. So procedural knowledge is knowledge of the skill, not the psychomotor skill, because the skill itself it belongs to the psychomotor domain. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted us to be clear that uh, I can write an excellent essay on how to do an appendectomy. That mm -hmm. is knowledge of the procedure. But when yeah. I'm given a patient to do an appendectomy, I may not have uh, the haptic uh, uh, psychomotor skills. So procedural knowledge would be more of knowledge of the operating skill rather than the operating skill. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Are there yeah. any more questions or clarifications back to the audience? Thank you. Uh, not really a question, Professor, but I think a comment. Uh, we are privileged currently that uh, we have a number of um, uh, individuals who have come up and trying to help us um, improving our continuous medical education. So uh, currently, many of you, you have noticed that we sent out um, a message. I think the registrars and uh, ophthalmologists we are collecting. Uh, we are going to get emails. And um, there's uh, uh, Mr. Payot and the family who have offered to pay for all the ophthalmologists and registrars in Zambia to be registered under um, the American Academy of Ophthalmologists. So that's a huge uh, 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 a bit, uh, a boost to us because it means we're not going to spend any money and yet we'll be able to access everything, the videos, uh, everything on CPD, we'll be able to access the, the journals that they've uh, subscribed, uh, subscribed to. And secondly also, there is a uh, OBIS uh, cyber site. They offer courses that we can actually go online and uh, be able to learn. And then almost on a weekly basis, they also have the, um, uh, the lectures that are offered. So we can do well to take advantage of that in learning. Yes, uh, uh, Professor, let me just read a question 
uh, that uh, Mr. Jerry asked, I think this should be to, uh, yes, uh, I think Dr. Gao has already answered. Mr. Jerry was trying to find out uh, uh, whether, um, I think I've lost the question. Yes, he was, he was asking the WCA, the WCEA app that we are using has no provision for eye health. Any plans to include them as soon? Uh, I'm not sure that Dr. Kawa can respond for the sake of people unable to read the messages in the chat box. Yes, Dr. Mumbi. Yes, um, I was saying yes, we have taken notes of this and we'll engage um, WCEA on the matter. Are there any other clarifications or questions concerning the two presentations? On, on my part, it's been a very productive afternoon, very insightful, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to participate. I think uh, at this point, uh, as a facilitator, uh, I can hand over to the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. I'm not sure. Do Dr. Funjika, are you still there? <clears throat> yes, I am. Thank you so okay. much. Yes, I think uh, it's been a very interesting uh, journal presentation. I think continuous medical uh, education is something we usually take so lightly when it's only, we usually think about it only at the end of the year when we start renewing the license and then you are being pressured by HPCZ to produce a CPD coin. I think from the presentation that we've had today, it's, it's been, uh, we've been told that CPD point collection is ongoing. It's something that has to happen almost all the time. Every time we attend a workshop, every time we attend a seminar, every time we attend a special lecture, we should aim to be able to collect CPD points so at the end of the year we grow in our knowledge and in the experience that, uh, that we've had. So I just want to thank uh, the presenters for today for the very insightful presentation. And I also want to thank our moderator, Professor Sekelani Banda, for taking time off the very busy schedule to just join us for this hour and for this presentation. Thank you so much. I think I hand over to Dr. Mundi for the last remarks. I think we have in the in the house the president, Dr. Kasongole, uh, supposed to make a comment. I think at the beginning, I don't know if we forgot about that. And also uh, someone from Coexa, that should be Mr. Robert Ntitima. I can't see him in the meeting, or any representative from Coexa. Uh, Dr. Kasongole, over to you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mumbi. Uh, I think just to appreciate the two presentations that we've had. They've been uh, really uh, done to, to, to the maximum. Very exciting. I've learned so much today. Uh, but just, just to say also that uh, I think today's talk has been the mother of all the presentations that we've had on our calendar as Zambia of Knowledge Society this year. Uh, simply, of course, we've had the, you know, the the presence of uh, Health Profession Council of, of Zambia, being uh, you know represented by the director of, of registration, Dr. Membe. We really appreciate your time for having come to join us. And also to appreciate Professor Seke for coming on board. Prof Seke is a guru of medical education in Zambia. And really we appreciate your you know, support for coming on board today. And uh, as Dr. Mundi has mentioned, we've uh, been enjoying this platform that the College of Ophthalmology of Eastern, Central and Southern Africa has provided for us to conduct the CMAs. We would like to send a huge appreciation to COEXA for their support. I think, uh, as we've, as I've said before in uh, many of our sessions, COVID has come with its obvious uh, you know, burden, but at the same time, it has these advantages that have allowed us to have the learning opportunities. Almost every week we have a meeting online we're able to exchange knowledge, come up with something new. Because in the past, you agree with me that it had to take months and months for one to uh, attend a you know, meeting or a conference. Of course, the challenge that comes with the online you know, meet, meet, meeting is that the points that you get are so little. And for one to accrue to the 100 points, if you're getting five points for each meeting, 
really poses a huge challenge. I hope the council, at least for this year, will find it, uh, uh, you know, will find a way uh, to provide some sort of waiver for the many of us. Because I think the online thing is something that we're all trying to catch up with and uh, get used to it. And, and, and also just to emphasize that CME is crucial to the prosperity of healthcare providers. It allows practitioners to learn and discover the many ways of how we can uh, improve on the patient care, you know, the delivery, and to effectively manage our career in this ever-changing uh, landscape of medical uh, in, in, in industry. And then I'd also just like to mention that uh, a month ago, HPCZ acknowledged Zambia, Zambia Health Society as a provider for CPD for our health personnel. Many thanks to HPCZ. We are happy and we look forward to this uh, you know, environment that we provided for us to engage and work together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Kasongoli. I'm not seeing anyone from COEX uh, so far, unless there's one, uh, anyone with one comment that can be made as we close. Okay, I'm seeing uh, Dr. Paula. Um, yes. I just wanted to find out, this has been a fantastic presentation. As I said, it's been long overdue because we are not actively teaching um, uh, students and even doctors on how to conduct these CPDs. My question is, do we have continued medical education as a curriculum in the postgraduate studies? Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, you, yes, we can hear you, Dr. Paul. I think this question, uh, should we ask the, the educators, the people involved actively in, it, in uh, training of postgraduates, uh, pick up that question? Right. Anyone who can pick up that question? I'm seeing Dr. Machalimba, Dr. Pateo, Dr. Fonjika. Dr. Pateo, Dr. Fonjika, any, any response? Yes. I, I wouldn't know. I don't think I have any information. I thought Professor Banda would know. I think he's not a medical patient. I'm not sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Funjika. I, I'm not sure I quite understand uh, GM's question. Uh, do, Dr. Paula, <laughs> wait. <laughs> when she mentions <laughs> when she mentions that uh, a curriculum, uh, basically my understanding would be that each professional body that is promoting the education uh, into uh, a group of practitioners into uh, their field would itemize some of the things that would be called uh, CPD. Yeah, I, I think uh, Sampa did mention the need for a needs analysis. Uh, yes. This needs analysis is one of the things that uh, you could do uh, as a professional body and then identify the needs for people at different levels. And then the practical nuts and bolts of how to get people involved in CPD is now where the regulator helps motivate us by telling us that we do actually require points uh, from CPD. Then the two uh, can then work together to come up with what you would call a curriculum for the particular professional uh, body. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Probably maybe what I meant was um, a bit of educational etiquette for each profession, like for us ophthalmologists, are we imparting the etiquette for the future ophthalmologists, how to conduct themselves? 
Dr. Bola, if I understand you well, maybe to just um, uh, amplify is um, when someone finishes uh, from training, how do they go about acquiring new, new knowledge or how do they continue in the path of learning? Is that what you mean? That and also, uh, yes, how do they continue doing that also is how we conduct ourselves as ophthalmologists, the etiquette of ophthalmologists. Mm -hmm. any, any response to that? Yes, I think in 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 the main, uh, Professor Pola, uh, Dr. Pola is saying that uh, there is supposed to be a community of practice, the etiquette in terms of professional behavior, attitudes, absolutely, uh, and their responsibility to best practice. Uh, and she's interrogating that aspect: that are we, uh, as a community of practice of ophthalmologists? do you have a package that speaks to that? So I, I can only speak in general terms in paraphrasing it, but I can not answer that question. That would have to be answered by uh, the ophthalmologist. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I think that's food for thought. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on that note, if there are no any other um, uh, pressing matters, we'll call it a day. Uh, we just want to mention that um, this coming Sunday, we are running last of our series on um, uh, HSV keratitis. So this Sunday, we'll be doing the complicated cases with Dr. Vinit, the cornea specialist. We have done two, uh, two series so far. So we'll be concluding with the last one this Sunday. Thank you very much, and we hope to meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.